using prescription pills. I've used pills before, but like sporadically. So I started with like Percocet 5 milligrams. Most and people went to Percocet 10 milligrams. They'll do a Percocet or something, and then they'll do the next thing, and then the next and thing. And it went to Oxycontin. Oxycontin. 80, 80 milligrams. And then it got to a point where it was expensive. It was, of course, you know, you can get heroin, heroin. for cheaper. Which you eventually it led into heroin when I couldn't afford heroin. the pills anymore. I started shooting up. That's when my whole life, it just changed. Spiraled out of control. Out of control. That was it. Like, I knew I was addicted to pills. Pills were great, but the first time I smoked heroin, I was like, that's it. That is what I love. A lot of people chase their first high, and I already knew right after my first time using it that it wasn't enough. What we know is that of those people that use heroin, roughly one in three to one in five will develop heroin addiction. One in three to one in five means 20 to 33 percent. Not good. Welcome to chapel. We have new girls that need to be introduced. So mentors, if you will please introduce your new ladies. This is Jackie Dawson. She's 26. She likes to be second time here. She's very grateful to be here. Yeah. The biggest thing I've learned about the heroin addiction is that the public thinks that it's a matter of getting those people fixed. You're going to send them to treatment and they're going to get fixed. That's not possible. A heroin addiction and opiate addiction is a lifelong problem. Now, you might not use all your life, but you're at risk. See the invisible coin? Yeah, yeah. Pull it out of your ear. What's that coin say? can't talk because you lost your voice or your emotions. <laughs> this is a facility for women and women with children that helps broken women, women who are broken because of drug addiction, uh, alcoholism, domestic violence, get back on their feet, get stabilized both clinically and both spiritually. Thank you for the sisterhood and all the blessings we have here, Lord. May we uh, say all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. A woman in need comes into our program and is committing to a minimum of 12 months. During that 12 months, she's in both program, 12 steps, program, behavioral modification, program work therapy models so that she learns to have a work ethic and, and when to get up, when to go to work, how to respond and act at work. It's, it is highly successful. Uh, we have about an 85% success rate when a girl comes in and when a girl finishes, which is huge. It's huge, but it's a, an interesting social model, full holistic life transforming because it's bigger than change. It's We're asking them to change everything. That first step's the hardest it is, one. It is. As long as you get in the door, it's awesome. Yeah, that you're I haven't been able to really get anywhere any time under, uh, under my belt in sobriety for maybe a, you know, a week at a time and now I have nine months so it's been a really big one. So, so yeah. great. It's That's awesome. here. That is wonderful. And yeah. is it this program that made a difference? Oh, definitely. Because I've tried other programs okay. as well and I think it's just the, the good foundation those programs that called the 12-step programs uh, started 80 years ago in Akron, Ohio and have spread now globally. And those are fellowships of recovery. They're people who have uh, confronted these problems and, and overcome them, uh, but they also are aware that they're one day away from a relapse. What was the longest time you stayed sober before? Uh, like 11, 12 months, a year, but like nine of that I was pregnant. Yeah. So I feel like that does it. It doesn't count as much. Because I thought the 12 step program was a joke. So coming here and seeing people happy like at rehab, I didn't get it. And I remember like being here on like my eighth day because I was writing in my journal. I'm still gonna wanna go out and use after this. Like I'm just gonna do this and see if it works or I'm gonna, and I, I'll leave. Like a continual process to do them over again, but like, yeah. I feel like doing step eight and step nine is such a weight lift. I'd used pills before, but like sporadically. And at that point I didn't really know like that I was addicted. And then it got to a point where 
It was expensive. And uh, a friend from high school told me that he had heroin. And so I started spending my money on that. It was cheaper, it was easier to get. And so I was doing that behind my boyfriend's back. And uh, I started with smoking it. And then when he found out and we did it together, I started shooting up heroin for about two years. But you need to want to be here. I understand those days when you don't want to be here, because some days I don't. <laughs> but I don't have a drug addiction. You do. And the option of leaving for some of you is really a business. I started using pills in a party environment when it was presented to me. It just kind of boosted my self-esteem, which is something I struggled with for a long time. You've broken the bridge with your family. You've broken the bridge with your children. You've broken the bridge everywhere, and you don't really have a lot of options. For some reason, when I did pills, I thought I still wasn't a drug addict. You know, I wasn't the typical person doing drugs. And then as soon as I, you know, I was so desperate, I was sick from, you know, withdrawing from the pills. And in a desperate, desperate moment, I switched to the heroin. And the first time I got high, it was, it was like the pills times 100. So many pieces to addiction um, that affected you. I started you know, using, and then when I couldn't support my habit because I needed more and more, um, you know, your body de develops quite a tolerance pretty quickly, so you need more, you need to spend more on it. And um, I started getting desperate, and I started stealing from my from my jobs. You know, I got fired from a different, a couple different places. I've actually gotten arrested for um, theft as well. And um, you just get to this point where you will do anything for that drug. It's like a necessity. How we thought we were so free, and like that addiction is it's not freeing at all. Like it is heavy to carry it. I had two jobs. I worked at a tattoo shop, and I lost both those jobs. I lost custody of my daughter to my parents. Once I started shooting up heroin, I. I couldn't stop and I stopped caring and I stopped caring about my daughter and her needs, which are a lot. And just all I cared about was, was getting high. Whom have you physically harmed? It's a rough one. I was always really good at harming people with my words, so the people I harmed physically are myself and my daughter. My, myself by shooting up meth and heroin, not eating for days and letting myself get pushed around by several men. I physically harmed Paisley by not giving her medication, not doing her physical therapy, not changing her diapers, and sometimes not feeding her or at all, or not feeding her at all. I don't know how much heroin I shot up. The last thing I remember is taking a handful of pills and shooting up a lot of heroin. And then I remember being woken up and like uh, firefighters and EMTs being around me and me being taken to the ambulance. And then I was in Sholo. And then I remember kind of at the hospital, them saying I had to be life lighted down here. And um, I woke up in the ICU down here at, at a hospital down here. And because um, my blood was so toxic, I was in a special part of the ICU. And I spent 16 days in the hospital. The guy that I was with told me that when he came home, I wasn't breathing and I had vomit in my mouth. And that the EMT said three to four more minutes and I wouldn't have been dead. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that. And I was like, I'm not going to a year-long rehab. I'm not going anywhere. I don't need help. Like, I can do it by myself. And it just took, there was just one moment where I just, I don't know what it was. I just needed to get help. And I was able to admit that. And they, they brought me to rehab. All right, you have something. What do you got? Problems are inevitable. Some problems can be anticipated. Some are surprises but the idea that problems occur regularly need, to, need never be a surprise. The good news is that for every problem, there's a solution. My family didn't know where I was for close to a year. Um, I got arrested again on a drug paraphernalia charge, so I went to jail, I think, for a week that time. I got my probation extended, and then I got arrested a third time a few months after that and for another drug possession charge. Did about three months, and then I came here. What are you going to do on your first the rest or. of my amends. <laughs> I have to do my... Okay, so pretty much the first pass I take, I'm going to go to my parents' house in Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. and, um, I've already seen my grandparents and my aunt and uncle, but they're all going to be there with my parents, yeah. with my brother and my two sisters. Yeah. I've had a lot of fears before, um, but I really have no intentions of going back to my old life. I'm so lucky I have my family. I have a really good support system. And now I have a good foundation to base my sobriety off of. You know, I... Um, I'm ready. I, I don't. I don't. And in any way, I want to go back to that life. It's probably gonna take forever. <laughs> I'm getting strong enough.
there are times where I'm, I do feel like it'd just be so much easier to go back out there. But I think that's the point is that life isn't, it feels easier, but it's not. And um, I can, I feel like I'm, I'm building strength here. And for today, I, I feel strong enough. <laughs>